Thank you all so much for being here. This is, uh, it's an honor to come and you guys are so important. To me, you're all true chicken ears for just being here. And then what I hope you do is what you learn is go out and share with people because we really need to bring chickens back into our culture. Uh, they never should have left, but they did. And I'll show you, I'm gonna show you many, why, why it's time. I always like to have a chicken, and as I, as I tell on our online courses, like Brad said, we, we have a 10-class course that leads to the Backyard Chicken Keepers Certification course, uh, search certificate, and then we have seven other courses that lead to the Master Backyard Chicken Keepers Certification. Somebody had to do it, right? But anyway, um, this is my co-presenter, Oprah Henfrey. It's H-E-N hyphen F-R-E-E, -E, Henfrey, because we want free hens in every backyard in America who wants them. That's our goal. And I know we'll succeed with that when I can go to any town or city in the U.S. and see more chickens than dogs in front yards. And it's happening. It's happening all across. The in fact, I'm pleased to say I've been doing this for almost 30 years. And I'm pleased to say that for the first time last year, I feel like the chicken movement is unstoppable now. That we chant, it's, it's, it's got its own moment. She, she agrees. And she wants to thank you too. So give it up here for Oprah Henfrey. I'm going to put her back for right now. This is, um, this is actually only her second gig. So uh, yeah. <laughs> she said thank you. That was sugar. This is a poster of Heritage Breeds. You got it? See, there's quite a few there. This is from the uh, late 1800s. Which one of these breeds is endangered of becoming extinct? All of them. All of them. All of them. All of them. I mean, we're not only losing speciation across our planet in flora and fauna by the millions, we're also losing our livestock are endangered. And that's why I've been a member of the Livestock Conservancy for uh, about three decades now and will continue. Uh, I'll leave out and you can t come and take a look at it um, later on. But I just want to emphasize that these heritage breeds are critically important. Um, I've done some work with Monticello. We've been working for seven years to get chickens on Mulberry Row, which is where the enslaved community are raised chickens. And this is a Thomas Jefferson impersonator, and that is one of my hens. I want you to know. So this is this is gone. Uh, this is. <laughs> I was very pleased with that, and uh, I think Leslie Bauman's just about ready to do it, but we'll try. So anyway, heritage breeds. These are the books I've either authored or co-authored. Uh, thank you for Brad for giving me the uh, introduction there. Um, what I'm thrilled about is City Chicks is coming out in its second edition. Uh, it's out of print right now because we're, we're literally sold out. But the next edition, they're going to change the subtitle to Employing Chickens. You know, it, it's not enough to keep chickens anymore. We've got to put them to work. In my opinion, chickens are the most underemployed workforce in America. And they can actually even help us w address climate change because they can carbon sequester tons and tons of carbon and divert trash and, and biomass from the landfill. It's a, that, it's a triple hitter because it keeps gas for, for, gases from forming in the landfills. It creates carbon uh, and topsoil and decreases the CO2 level. So that's just one thing. That, that, so the subtitle is Garden Helpers, Compost Creators, Biomass Recyclers, Local Food Producers, and uh, Global Climate Defenders. So that'll be coming out um, soon. It's got to because it's, it's out of print. And the other is um, I've got so much material. I'm not going to go into them except to say um, it's all about putting them to work, and it's all about building soil. And the, the heritage breeds do the best, and, and local foods. Uh, the Livestock Conservancy, they've been around oh, for so long. And they're, they're, um, it's all our breeds that we're, we're in danger of losing. Pigs, sheep, uh, if any of you want to find local breeds, about whatever it is, local livestock, they have a website, and they, they'll be more than happy to assist you, whatever you need to do. What I would say is the definition of, of a heritage bird this was, <laughs> it took a long time for the uh, American Poultry Association. They're the guys that host the poultry, poultry shows across the US. But they came up with these four, four characteristics of heritage breeds. Uh, they, 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 they were bred and developed before the 1900s. Why is that important, to have them uh, be in existence before the 1900s? Well, what happened right after World War II ended in 1945? Say again? Well, genetic, oh, you're talking about the Cornish class? Well, that, that came on a little bit later with the, uh, the, the Chicken of Tomorrow contest with AP&P and, and the USDA. But what happened? Uh, <laughs> yeah, everything went inside. Everything went to the family, in, in the factory farms, in, including the chickens. 
so that's why before 1900s, they, they had, had more of the true race, uh, the true breed that was developed. They have to be naturally mating. Do you know the Cornish cross, the meat bird? How many of you know the meat bird? I'm going to talk about them a little bit more. They can't mate. I mean, they can't naturally mate because they, they develop such huge breast meat that literally they can't even mount each other. And what about the, the broad-breasted white turkey? 100% of them cannot mate. Well, it gives new, how do we have them? Well, it gives new meaning to turkey basting, doesn't it? <laughs> no, it's for real. So one of the things about these heritage birds is they're naturally mating. They, they were developed a long time ago. They have a long, productive outdoor, outdoor, outdoor lifespan. You know, these birds that were factory farmed, they've been specifically designed to gain a lot of weight real fast and live inside under strictly controlled conditions. So when we bring these birds out in our backyards, we can't expect the same performance uh, as, as the factory farm birds, but I can tell you, and I'm gonna go into it in a little more detail, it's a little controversial, but we, 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 they also give you a different human nutritional value for their products. Uh, and then slow growth rate. They have a market weight no less than 16 weeks, four months. You know, so if you're a producer, you go, oh yeah, I wanna support the heritage breeds, and then you start to do the math, and you go, okay, I can have a Cornish cross an industry meat bird ready for four to, from a chick, literally a chicken a cough, kind of ounces about what it weighs, to a pro product within five weeks, four to five weeks, versus four months. So you've got your labor, your, your, your uh, feed, your infrastructure, your, your, uh, all the management. So that's why it's so hard to source heritage breeds is because they take so much long to longer to grow. And they're more expensive to grow. I mean, you can't have to expect to pay 40, 50, 60 dollars for a bird. But guess what? You can do that. You mind having heritage birds in your backyard? You know, do you have to process them all at once? If you don't have open free space, can you understand how they can do well? How they can do so much more work in your backyard? So that's part of the advantages of it. So that's that's where we're starting from is the definition of a heritage bird. Um, what we're going to talk about, I didn't quite finish this slide because I kept changing this because I, I realized I had the restricted time, and, and I, but I wanted to cover some pretty key items. Um, chicken's history with humans, and I, I know there was a workshop earlier about how the chicken crossed the world or how the chickens interacted. With, I'm going to touch on that a little bit more. The perfect storm for humans and how chickens can help, that's something I've been thinking about for decades. And I want to bring that, I mean, I could do a whole day just on that one particular topic. Chicken skill sets, uh, status chickens and therapy chickens, and then heritage versus factory farm chickens in both meat and eggs. So I'll be glad to take questions along the way. Uh, the time is a little bit short, but if it's, I'm here for you. So if there's some burning question, if it's too complicated, I'll just say we'll talk, talk afterwards. But if you do have questions, I'll be glad to take them. I'd rather have, do that and answer your questions than finish a few slides, you know? Okay. So chickens rule. This was put out by the Smithsonian Magazine. How many of you read this article? It's really, you can get it online. Really, really well written. But they wrote how chickens conquered the world. And you see, chickens have been with us as long as dogs and cats. It's estimated from, from five to 10,000 years we've gone along. And it's a natural symbiotic relationship. The chickens would be around the human encampments, eating the scraps and the foods, whatever, and the, chick, uh, the humans would give the chickens protection from, from pred predators, night and, and day. So they sort of evolved along. And one of the things that uh, we're trying to do is to literally uh, chick start America. I'm with the uh, Gossamer Foundation. It's a nonprofit dedicated to global sustainability and local foods. Think about that. Global sustainability and local foods. We really believe we cannot have one without the other. And who do you think is the cornerstone, the gateway, the enabler, and the PowerPoint for local foods? Chickens. Chickens, they, they're, the, they're the gateway drug. I'm a pharmacist, as many of you know. So you know, you get some hooked on chickens and then pretty soon they've got little baby goats and, and little, little, little milking Devons and they're gardening, oh my God, and they're outside and the kids are outside and gosh, they're looking healthier. So this is, this was, these are from photos from a, from a home and garden show on the, it was the East Coast Home and Garden Show and the Richmond, um, Richmond, Virginia had just legalized chickens, and so uh, Murray McMurray donated 306 heritage uh, baby chicks, poets, and we gave uh, three, uh, four chicks to first-time flock owners. 
And these are, these are some of the pictures from that. And, and we, we continue to, we've probably given away about almost 4,000 uh, baby chicks now to first time flock owners. And, and they, have, uh, they go with home with a, bat, with, a, with a phone number to call if they need, they have instructions, feed is often donated by New Country Organics and other feeders. And so what happened now is, is about five years after that, all the cities on the East Coast except Virginia Beach had legalized chickens. So we've got, we call them, we call them our six, uh, 306 peeps of light went out <laughs> and helped enlighten people on the East Coast. But there's something about when you first hold a baby chick, um, and I'm going to get into that under a little bit of the therapy section. Well, now the question I think comes up is, I think, I think humans have chicken envy. You know, there's, there's chicken art in every culture, except maybe the North and South Poles, but, but here's, here's just some examples, you know. I mean, here's the guy, uh, has his feathers on, and he's saving the dam, you know, the lady, whatever she is, and there's a pyramid. This other one, uh, that's, uh, well, anyway, he's, it looks like he's crowing at dawn, you know, he's got his feathers on. Here's a dude that's uh, flying, you know, like a, this is a painting by Ruben Duran where, where he's just taken off to meet the heavens. Here's, um, <laughs> this is a picture from Williamsburg, and, and I know this man, but uh, that's, that's, by the way, a, a, something like a three or $4,000 costume he has on. And when he found out, you want to take a picture with chickens? with this Anyway, yes, they did. And so we got this po photo, it's from Williamsburg. And what was interesting is uh, ornamental and bantam fowl in, in the American colonial times were becoming increasingly popular because they were popular in Europe. And even when Jefferson went over here, went over there for his time, he came back and he was started raising bantam hens. And, and what was interesting is uh, that the colonists copied what was going on in America, the elite ones anyway. So th this is at uh, one of the uh, uh, Heritage Harvest Days at Monticello, but, but Jefferson had a bantam hen that his daughter absolutely adored. The whole family adored this little bantam hen. And it's so much so that when that little hen died, they had a full family funeral. And I've asked them at Monticello, you know, they have a family graveyard there. I said, they have, an, they have a pet graveyard and they have one for humans. And I've challenged them, let's find that chicken. Let's find out what breed she really was. We, if we could uh, uh, just, just uh, but I, that, that hasn't happened yet. But. But Jefferson was also interested in pigeons. And he, he created this uh, elaborate dove coat that he didn't actually build up Monticello, but another fellow close by built, the, built the, an actual one uh, using the plans from it. So why was, were pigeons so popular in the colonial days and, and medieval days even? Anyone know? Pigeon poo. Not only great for fertilizer, it makes the grape smell uh, sound uh, taste really good, but also King George IV declared that all the pigeon poop in the land was his, so he could make gunpowder. You can make gunpowder out of pigeon poop, and I can tell you how, but I can't do it right now because we don't have enough time. It's pretty <laughs> yucky, really. So the bantam that we think that Jefferson had was one called a puncheon, uh, or something that looked like this. Uh, it was. It was. Um, it's now, <laughs> it's it, now it's, it doesn't exist anymore. It, this one had to be crossbred out, I think, with a mill floor. But some of the genetics are still there. But isn't that a sweet little bird? I mean, you can see why they absolutely fell in love with it. This, uh, there aren't, you won't see any of these at the shows yet, but hopefully we can bring them back, like the buck. How many know about the buckeye bird? Yeah, you know, they almost were extinct. Literally, and the Livestock Conservancy, Jeanette Beringer and, and, uh, and a couple others, they, they brought them back to the point that two years ago, the, the Buckeye rooster took a grand champion, a reserve grand champion at the Columbus show. I mean, from almost extinction to, to first, that, it gives me chills right now. <laughs> yeah. So chickens on Mulberry Row, I talked about a little bit. And uh, what's interesting is chickens in colonial times were held in really low esteem. They were considered poor people's food. Uh, during the 18th century, and what Jefferson, even in his own writings of livestock, and you know, he was very detailed in how he kept things. He did not include chickens as his livestock because that was that was the domain of the enslaved community. And yet they they would purchase chickens and have chickens dinner. There's a lot of you know recipes for chicken dinners. So um, chickens. Uh, it was interesting because I was up on Capitol Hill when we were trying to get chickens legal there, meeting with the uh, with the um, uh, um, legal counsel to the mayor. And there was a reaction against chickens from the Afro-American community there because they felt like it represented more of a poverty thing than it did to have enabling gardening things. So there's a lot of concepts that we need to go, go over. 
Um, and it's interesting how that's changed, but people still think chickens are dumb, stupid, dirty, you know, yucky, and, and you don't want to have them around, but all you want to do is eat them. Uh, <laughs> so chickens, everywhere chickens went, uh, everywhere chickens went, everywhere humans went, uh, went, went with them. In boats and ships, canoes, horseback. I mean, this this is a this is a picture from Kona Williamsburg. There, that, those are chicken baskets up there on top, with that. So they even went to Easter Island. Who knows about Easter Island? It's in the middle of nowhere, three thousand miles from. That somehow, people got there and they got there in canoes somehow. And guess what they had with them in the canoes? They had chickens. They had chickens. Easter Island's most known for these huge statues. I mean, their story's high. And what they found out relatively recently is that the statues have bodies, and they're starting to excavate them. And these bodies, I mean, look at, that, look at that little guy up there on top. I mean, that's, that's about three or four stories high, and they're still not done digging. On all of these bodies are, are glyphs, hieroglyphs and, and symbols etched, and nobody has a clue what they mean. How cool is that? But what also what they had on Easter Island is literally hundreds and hundreds of chicken coops, stone chicken coops. That's the only building material they had. So that's, that's how they were trying to manage their agriculture, is they, they would micromanage the chicken manure, and they had to protect against the winds that were coming across from the ocean. And so they built these, these uh, coops. Some of them were incredibly elaborate. Uh, this one, for example, uh, is multi-story. You can walk into it. Uh, and and here's a, here's a sketch, just a, you, uh, you can Google this and find it on there, but this is just kind of a sketch of how they manage their gardens and their coops and they use the stone. Well, as you know, Easter Island, it's, it's probably infamous for whatever, but it uh, ended in ecological collapse. Why did it end in ecological collapse? What happened to it? There was nothing left. There was no topsoil. There were no trees. Some people brain the, the rats for eating the trees. I mean, come on. <laughs> so no, it ended in a whole e ecological collapse. Uh, it, it resulted down into tribalism and then even eventually cannibalism. And this has happened in, in cultures, various cultures across the planet when, when, they're, uh, uh, when their ecological system gives out. So what happened? And Jared Diamond, of anyone, he also he wrote Guns, Germs, and Steel, an, an incredible book, and he also wrote a book called Collapse, uh, not Collapse. He, yeah, it's called it's called Collapse, and um, Jared Diamond wrote in Collapse. He goes, "Is Easter Island Earth writ small? Is Easter Island the ecological <laughs> collapse?" Ah, uh, uh, see, the cock has crowed. <laughs> There's also a, a book that affected my, my uh, uh, education and belief system very deeply. It's called Empty Harvest. It's an older title. When I first saw that title, I thought, what an awful cover. That's just horrible. Then I read the book, and I said, oh, gee, that's a perfect title. And, and what the subtitle is is Understanding the Link Between Our Food, Our Community, and Our Planet. Food, Immunity, and Planet. And as a pharmacist, I'm going to say, what we need to do is understand the link between your food and your immunity and our planet. How many of you here besides me have absolutely no allergies at all? Probably quite a few here, yeah, okay. More than most groups, I can tell you, more than, more than most. But I, I'm, uh, I'm big on nutrition and genetics. That was one of my, that was my um, major in, in animal science. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how, how chickens individual, uh, affected individuals. Robert E. Lee, did you know that he had a war chicken? Now, I couldn't make this up if I wanted to. <laughs> this is really, and, and uh, th what happened is, is a little hen got away from the Northern Army that was carrying some food up to some of the troops, and they chased her, and they were, they were running, she dashed this way and that way, and, and she ended up in a tent, dashed in, and so she stayed there, and she settled down, I guess, under the bunk, and, and just stayed there the night, and so what'd she do the next morning? Well, she laid an egg, and whose tent was it? Robert E. Lee's. Talk about a lucky hand. So, so <clears throat> there he was. The great general, uh, he enjoyed the fresh egg for breakfast. He uh, liked him all the way. Uh, he, kept, uh, he kept his flap open for her so she would come in. She wandered around the cap. All the soldiers knew that was the general's chicken. Uh, at least in the beginning, they all knew that. It was, so um, there was one time when they were actually, by, by the way, he called her Miss Nellie. 
Miss on the front of a name in, in the South means it's a sign of respect. So if they call you Miss Pat or something. So Miss Nellie one time went missing. And it was missing uh, when they were retreating from, from the Battle of Gettysburg. I mean, the whole army was in retreat and they couldn't find this hen. So I'm not kidding. I couldn't make this up yet. What did the great general do? He stopped the retreat. Find Miss Nellie. You better go find her. We're not moving until we find that end. So they eventually did find her. She had, she had uh, bunked down in, in one of the supply wagons and was very, very happily just sitting there while they found So once they found her, they, they continued on the retreat. So, um, and the general himself had, and joined in on the hunt for it. And she traveled with the, the Army of the Northern Virginia for over two years, two years. And I can just imagine, can't you, that, that the general you know, with all the horrors of that war, that, that this little hen brought some semblance of home and, and a softness and, and good eggs, good nutrition. So she was one of his most valued, uh, valued uh, companions during the Civil War. I mean, there's, there's a lot more on it, but there. So the other thing about these heritage birds is, is they make wonderful therapy chickens. We have an online course on therapy chickens and the book's coming out shortly. It's the training of handlers and their birds to do public visitations. And what we're finding is we can take these birds into institutions. Um, this particular one uh, was a, a, a rehab facility. This, this gentleman is Doug. He was an officer shot in a uh, line of duty in the head. And when I went in to give his little presentation, I also took some chicken catalogs with, it, with the pictures on it, Maria, Maria and, and uh, Randall, they all have some really good ones. But when I walked in, he was just like this. And, just, and, and what I did is I let the chicken lap hop. I just put a, put a towel around and, and they just, whoever wanted to hold the chicken, I got it. So, so she, they would just pass her around. And so when it came to Doug, he was sitting there and, put the, and he goes, want to hold the chicken, Doug? And he goes, and he kind of looked up and he goes, chicken. Chicken, and he started, you know, patting her really hard, and she was going, "Oh my God!" And so easy, easy, easy. But what was interesting is the staff were draw, jaw dropped. They had not seen any reaction from him at all for much of anything, not dogs or cats or, or even to, uh, people. But this chicken rang his bell somehow. And I went back a couple weeks later, and I, I just wanted to check in on him, check in on him, check it out. Uh, and I said, Doug, how are you doing? Remember the chicken? Chicken. You go to the chicken. So, so there's something about the feather, t uh, the softness of it, and the tactile of it, and the, the chickens can be so disarming because they're gangly and kind of funny. And I mean, who could be afraid of Oprah Henfrey over there? You know, <laughs> I mean, just they're beautiful. I mean, some of them are true works of art. This, and uh, I mean, there are so many stories on them. this particular lady was at another nursing home, and. and um, she held the chicken and I was getting ready to leave and I went over and said, can I have the, the uh, Oprah back? And she kind of held on to her. Was, okay. Uh, uh. So I went and got my things together and I got my camera and I came back and I said, may I take your picture? She's very stoic. Yeah. So I got this picture. And what's interesting here is, is what you can't see is there's a tear coming down her cheek because it reminded her so much of her childhood and how much she loved being with those chickens and she did not want to give that chicken up. I mean, <laughs> she, she couldn't, yeah. So, so story after story like that, we're finding out that then with juvenile delinquents, we have remarkable uh, reactions to them and uh, with autism and, and differently enabled people, we have a lot of uh, reactions, especially, uh, yeah, but with both baby chicks and with full, full grown birds. And then this, you guys okay there? You need a tissue? Oh, you're hot? <laughs> that steamed you up, did it? <laughs> okay. I was out in California um, doing a, a five-week book tour for City Chicks when it first came out, and I was visiting this young girl came out and says, you want to meet my best buddy? I said, well, sure. So she dashes behind the bar and she comes back out with this. <laughs> I'm going, oh my gosh. And I, was I took one look at that, and, and, and so I said, I'm going to take your picture. So, so what are his eyes telling me? Yeah, yeah. You're me. You come in. And what are her eyes saying? You know, see my best buddy? Yeah. So uh, roosters have a place too. I, I love roosters. And they're doing. So I'm going to switch, switch. Any questions so far? Uh, okay. Look at his, his feet are as big as her hands there. I mean, I was surprised she could pick him up. So you know he was gentle. He'd been carried around quite a bit. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Cornish meat birds. I mean, this, this, this is a talk on heritage breeds, but to really understand the heritage breeds, I think we need to know a little bit more about the commercial breeds and what the uh, opposite, pole, opposite end of the stick is. The Cornish cross meat bird, it's a, and as well as the uh, white legern, they are single purpose breeds. They provide meat, 
and they lay eggs. That's it. I mean, they're, they're not intended for anything else. You don't expect the, the meat bird to produce eggs later on. You don't expect the, the, uh, 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 the white legger and the egg bird to produce much meat. So, and it doesn't matter if they're on pasture, sunshine, or they're fed organic feed, these birds have hypergrowth or hyperlaying. We, when we had our find, we had a 31-acre organic free-range poultry ranch, I recall. We also had some Tamworth pigs and some, but uh, we, we, um, that was a time when um, the uh, FedEx and the U USPS was threatening to not ship baby chicks in the mail, and we were getting our chicks. Up. So when we ran our business plan through, if we couldn't get chicks in the mail, we were out of business. And it just stopped us dead in the tracks. So that's when we got our own breeder flock. So we researched it, and we, we came up with our own breeder. Uh, breeder flock, and they were out on pasture, they were on organic feed, and we collected the eggs and incubated them and put them out on pasture, and the, that's where the Day Range Poultry book came out of. Um, but that's another topic, too. But the point of these is, these birds are obese, hypergrowth, sluggish, and terminal. They hardly ever live beyond 12 weeks max. They're usually processed by four to six weeks, uh, and you've got a product. So what's interesting is America's main meat of choice, excuse this typo there, main meat of choice right now is chicken. To the extent that most Americans, the average American eats, uh, over 18, eats, maybe even under it, eats about 89, about 90 pounds of chicken every year. That's just chicken, that doesn't include turkey, but, but it's a massive amount, it's the, the, new, the new health food, right? The, uh, and 100% of the commercial chicken, uh, about 100% of the chicken that anybody eats, unless you raise your own, because I talked about how expensive it is to use heritage, is at the Cornish Cross, so the, this is on Coria. Com. You can look this up. Everything I document that I say, I look up. Well, one of the studies that came out, there are others, but this is the one that I think that was most profound. It came out, I call it the fat chicken study. It says modern organic and broiler chickens sold for human consumption provide more energy from fat than from meat. Organic broiler chickens. More, now, that's just the opposite of a healthy animal, isn't it? Like a deer that, that's out there that has, you would get more energy if you ate it from its pro protein, its muscles, or, or grass-fed, grass-finished cows. So this study was done uh, by Dr. Wang and group, and it was done by the Institute of Brain Chemistry and Human Nutrition. Now, that's a key. Brain chemistry and human nutrition, remember that. And it was done at the London Metropolitan University. This is not a fly-by-night university. This is a, a well-established older university. It was published back in 2009. This is nothing new. And there are other articles that go along with this. But have you heard anything about them? No. <laughs> so here's, here's a Cornish cross bird that I picked up from a grocery store. And, and that other one is one of my roosters. Uh, it was an Americana. And what's interesting when you look at these pictures is uh, what's the, one of the first things you notice? When you look at that, well, bigger. I mean, yeah. The, look how huge that breast meat is. Uh, everything's bigger. And then, what I've learned is form follows function. You can see the form. This, this, the one on the on the left. The, the, the Cornish cross can barely waddle around. Ours. I mean, we had less mortality than leg problems than most, but we still had mortality and leg problems. Because, uh, and then that rooster was out running around, jumping, having a great old life. I mean, happy, healthy, happy, healthy. Really happy, healthy, dead is what his life, which is what I want for myself, to be honest. You know, I don't want to do I mean, did you know that humans, we actually have the blueprint to easily live to 120 or more? It's like the Bible wasn't kidding. They, they really had people live that long. The, the trick is you've got to keep your detox pathways open, and you've got to have good nutrition to give your body the food it needs. But that's another whole topic, too. So form follows function. This guy's running around. The other guy is just waddling around. Follows human nutrition. Form follows function, follows human nutrition. So you get a different human nutritional value from the Cornish cross. And then look at its legs there. See how stumpy they are and they actually curve? Do you know why they're curved? Because it was so weight, it actually bent the bones that, that it couldn't, could, you know, whereas how straight they are on the other one. So there's a lot, it go, there's a cascading effect that goes down. There's more mitochondrial in, in a bird that's active. Uh, they have better circulation, so you've got more B vitamins and, and iron. Um, more, so it, there is a different human nutritional value, and, I, and the data are more <laughs> morale on that. And they taste different. You know, we have good taste buds for a reason when they're not tricked by. <laughs> food science. Here it is from the back. I mean, doesn't that look like a pig? I mean, really? So this study says fat chickens. At the extreme that these birds are high-fat chickens, uh, 
they are technically obese. Uh, not only that, I would say, I would add to this, it's, it, it, my comment is, well, if they were human, they'd be on statin drugs. You know, they're, they're so obese. Um, but it raises concern for, human, for animal nutrition, for animal welfare as, as well as human nutrition, and the big question that comes out, does eating obesity cause obesity? And that word for that now is obesogen. If you eat fat, are you eating more than just fat? Are you also eating signaling that goes up through the food chain? Um, and it gets a little more complicated, but uh, there's a thing called, I wasn't gonna bring this up, but you're, so, you're paying attention to me. There's a thing called xenohormesis. Xeno means foreign and hormesis means hormonal. And this, this, it's still a theory, but that's coming out more and more evidence. Does, does eating a certain, does eating fat cause fat, whether or not you eat, and does eating stress cause stress? That's one of the, and we know that uh, you know, stress through an animal's life causes different uh, biochemistry to you. Know, it causes you know, cortisol to rise and, and uh, when you process stuff. And, and there's, there's quite a bit of evidence that says, okay, well, say you eat a big steak at night or a big, <laughs> big fat chickens, and you, you, look in the, you look in the mirror in the morning, you kind of go, <laughs> well, was it that stress, that animal that had a stressful life and, and even worse, a stressful processing uh, for the, so anyway, I'm getting back to this about eating uh, obesogens and sort of are you eating more than, are you eating information as well as calories? I guess that's a point. And what they, this report actually said is that the mental health, because remember it was the, the, the College of Human Brain Chemistry and, and Human Nutrition, they link this and says that the increase in brain disorders this century has catapulted Ill, Ill health to a cost of 77 billion pounds in the UK. This is back in 2008, and I can bring these numbers up, but I just want to stick, stick true with the quote. It is by far greater, and remains to today, far greater mental health, far greater than any other health problem humans have, mental health. And I can tell you that in, in 2017, there were over 40, about 47 million Americans had some form of mental health problem. Now, think about that. We're talking about kids on ADHD drugs. We're talking about depression, Alzheimer's, uh, schizophrenia, chronomal minds, depression. I mean, it sort of goes down. When I was growing up, you know, we didn't have those ADHD drugs. And we stood in the corner or, or just went outside, but we didn't have that. But I, I just, um, as a pharmacist, I cringe every time. I just wonder, what are we doing to these young neural nets? that are developing still, and then we're, we're applying with these chemicals that are supposed to make them behave and focus. I mean, th but they can't go out and play around. I just adopted a dog for um, myself for Christmas. Uh, she's the uh, best thing I've done for myself. But one, and I, then I've been watching the dog whisperer, Cesar Milan, and, and what he says is, you know, to train a dog, you gotta, you gotta give it enough exercise so it gets rid of that toxic energy. It gets rid of the energy, it'll build up to be toxic. And our kids don't have enough, in my opinion, outlet for that toxic energy. So they end up, you know, being, so anyway, I got my, got my dog. Okay. So in the U.S. now, this we're up and up to 2013 mental health and substance abuse disorders cost 188 billion dollars, and um, it's just I mean we could talk about this all day too. But the point on this is that unhealthy fats from these chickens. Well, I, I, there's one important point I left out that is incredibly important about the Cornish cross. When they did the study of the Cornish cross, they they found out more pro, more energy from the fat than from protein. Then they analyzed the fat. What do you think they found in the fat? And this, this, these results have been duplicated by the American Pasture Poultry Producers Association and other groups across the country. That fat consistently has nine omega-6 to three, nine sixes to one three. And it's not that the sixes are bad, it's just the balance of it is bad. Nine, six, nine omega-6s to one three. So it's a really skewed form of, pro, of fat going up the, up the food chain, isn't it? And to the point that people almost eat their weight in it every year. So the, their question is, is, it, is, is these un, unhealthy fats that are traveling up the food chain, they say, although eating commercial birds alone can't be responsible for the rise in brain disorders, it is a part of a changing food system across the board, across the board, that has ignored human nutrient values. 
of people, and especially in their case, because they were the brain of human, uh, the brain, ignored what we need for our brains. And the vegetable oils are just as bad. They're, they're, they're almost hyper rancid. I please uh, know your fats, I can tell. If you want to keep your memory and, and uh, uh, even have, just know your fats, that's another. You see how complicated this is? So here's the other thing. What's your brain made of? What's your brain made of? Fat. We're, we're all fat heads, every one of us. And if you think if you don't have the right fats in your diet, do you think you're going to be able to think well? You're going to behave well? You're going to sleep well? I mean, it's just sort of, so your brain is the fattiest organ in your body, a minimum of 60% fat. And you've got to have the right fats for that neural net to be able to conduct that electricity that goes on in your whole nervous system. You know, we are electric beings. We are light beings. And we actually operate with fluorescence in our guts from the bacteria there. But, um, cholesterol is another big issue. Uh, your, your brain has about 20% of the cholesterol in your whole body is, is, is in your brain. And, you know, cholesterol is important for, it's in membrane function, it's, it's the basis uh, for your sex organs and your, your um, it's, uh, it goes on and on, but it's just incredibly important. Um, t cortisol, testosterone, even vitamin D functions on it. So when, when we start talking about the lipid, the lipids and the, the cholesterol problems in America, I'm gonna say, in my opinion, it's the kinds of fats you're eating. It, it's not that your body doesn't metabolize them well. Your body's doing the best it can be. I would even be so radical, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not opinionated, I mean, I'd be so radical that the obesity epidemic we have in America, it's not your fault. What your body's doing is searching and searching for calories, and it can't find it, so you keep eating and eating. It's still not there, so you're still not satisfied. And so, how are you going to find it? You just keep eating. So, that's my opinion, and I'm sticking to it. You get back to good, healthy foods, heritage, heirloom seeds from heritage breeds grown in living food web soils, and that fat will just melt away, and you'll feel so much better. That's, that's my opinion. So the solution here is to use heritage hands, hence this talk, right? And we already talked about where they came from. Well, the same thing true, guess what, applies to eggs. And there's a lot even more studies about eggs. A heritage egg comes from a heritage chicken as defined by the American Poultry Association. And I know in the egg talk it was really excellent, um, but he left out one little factor in there, I thought, that, that when you wash off that bloom or cuticle, I mean, nature knows best, right? And you think of the jungle file or a hen, hen in the woods, you know, does she have her, her uh, her eggs uh, sanitized? <laughs> Does she wash them off before? They, no, but she's in a nest. There's probably even some manure in there. She's rolling them around. The chicks hatch out. You know. So that bloom, nature has made it so amazingly uh, beautiful that, that it keeps a natural protection out that, that keeps bacteria and, and all the bad things out better than any sort of man-made mineral oil that you can spray back on it. The reason Americans have to refrigerate their eggs it's not for storage, it's because some of the hens in America already have that enteritis, salmonella enteritis colonies in their bodies. And so when they lay an egg, that egg is already infected. In Europe and other places, they require the hens to be vaccinated for the salmonella enteritis. It's a law. And then the eggs can't be refrigerated because they feel like, one, that you get a spouse much better animal husbandry by getting clean eggs to start with. And then two, that bloom is far better than anything man could come up with. To and then you don't have to add that carbon footprint of all the refrigeration. So I can just see this is, a, this is a, a picture from a grocery store in Scotland, and I can just hear it now where the American goes in and goes, excuse me, uh, excuse me, but I, I love eggs. And don't you guys eat eggs over here? I mean, we have eggs almost every morning for breakfast. No, I didn't see them over there by the milk, and this, this, the clerk would go, oh, dearie, 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 dearie. You must be American. We keep our eggs over there by the tea. And sure enough, there they go. Well, the other thing about eggs from heritage birds, uh, what's the difference when you eat a piece of meat versus a piece of pro uh, an egg? They're both protein, right? We just kind of put protein as one lump sum. But when you eat a piece of meat, how is that different to your body than when you eat an egg? It's hard to digest. Yeah, that meat has to be taken in by your body, broken down into its elemental uh, con constitutions, whatever, and then reabsorbed for whatever body part or energy you need it for, whether it's an eyelash or muscle or whatever. But that egg, when you think about an egg, there's, there's everything in that egg that is needed from a heritage, from a healthy, healthy bird. Everything in that egg is needed to produce a little baby chick in only 21 days. Its brain, its feathers, its, its scales, its muscles, its nervous system, its blood, everything is in that yolk. 
that is needed to produce a little baby chick. If there's everything, if it's that complete a form of protein, don't you think that might be a good nutrition for humans? So I want to say, eat your yolks from your source you know, which is, <laughs> and, and to me, like, when, you, when people say, oh, I only eat the whites because I want to be healthy, and to me it's like, if, if, if I gave you a bag, a paper bag with a golden nugget in it, and you ate the bag and threw the golden nugget away, that's kind of what you're doing if you throw the, the yolks away, in my opinion, okay, and all yolks are not equal. So any questions? I mean, that's quite a bit, I just, how am I doing on time? Two minutes? Two minutes. Two <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. Well, we already talked about how chickens are the gateways and the cornerstones. I want to talk about chicken skill sets, and I'm kind of going to leave you with this. Um, I think, I've been thinking about this a long, long time. I think we're into a perfect storm for our species. Uh, and these, there are nine factors in there that I think that are coming together kind of all at once on us. Uh, we have economic instability and hyperinflation. You know, the U.S. dollar is backed by nothing but faith. It went off the gold standard back in Roosevelt's era. And, and uh, you know, is it worth the paper it's printed on? In some countries, no. So, so we have hyperinflation, and uh, we're not sure what's going to happen. Uh, growing population, 9 billion and going strong. Um, nutritional poverty and hidden hunger. I talked about that a little bit with the heritage breeds. There's a lot more there we could talk about. But health care crisis, we're spending more on health care and, and feeling worse than ever before to where it's it's almost breaking everybody's budget. I mean, people are losing their homes over health care, for heaven's sakes. Um, contaminated and dead, eroded soils. Um, when I was on the book tour out in California, I, I'm a soils person, so I'd stop and I'd pick up the soil and look at it and smell it, sometimes even taste it. And, and when I picked it up, it's, it's basically subsoil. I mean, all the topsoil is gone. And then what did I hear out in those fields with hardly any other traffic around? Nothing. 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 So global warming, I don't care if you believe it or not, it, it's happening. It's too hot, too cold, too wet, too wide. We're having weather weirding, and that weather weirding is affecting pollination patterns and insects patterns, and it's going to be affecting our food supply very shortly. Here in Indiana, they barely got their corn in, you know, with, because it's been so wet. So, uh, and then peak soil. You know, we, we talk about peak oil, but we don't talk about peak soil. I think we're past peak soil already. Uh, there's only two inches between humans two inches between us and starvation of that soil. And Jared Diamond, in his, his book, uh, Collapse, he said two of the most important things that determine whether or not people thrive or collapse is topsoil and water. We need those two, peak oil. So all these things are coming together. And then the GMO crops, that's, a, that's another. And uh, my contention is I have very good reasons that chickens can help us address all of these, but the growing population. And uh, the other one is EMFs, the electromagnetic frequencies aren't there. So Michael Pollan wrote a wonderful letter to President-elect Obama, and in that letter he said, the health of a nation's food system is a critical issue of national security. National security, and he went on to say that if we don't solve our health problem and our food supply problem, we're not gonna solve the health care crisis, our energy dependence, you know, 17% of all the oil that America uses goes to produce food and bring it to your table. 70%. Our ability to learn, think, and do, environmental pollution, and feed ourselves. It's an ancient poultry proverb that's rung true through the century. Who, whoever controls your food controls you. I mean, that's been a military tactic across the ages, hasn't it? Starve them out, surround the castle, you know, do the embargo. So who, you have to ask yourself, who really controls your food? And the lights go out and that food supply stops. And it doesn't slow down. If, if the electricity goes out, it stops. There, there's no slowing down. I mean, how are you gonna, how are you gonna handle yourself? I would also go to say that I think keeping local chickens and having a strong food supply system, it's a matter of emergency preparedness and national defense. Because in my situation, I was in Virginia when that derecho went through, you know, they're just, <laughs> so, the, no warning, within five, five tenths, trees were falling. And uh, so I didn't have electricity for a week, and I looked in my backyard, I was still getting eggs. You know, if it got very long, I'd have a chicken dinner or two, and much longer that new country organic feed was really, it made a pretty good musla. You know, it was a little, I tried it. You know, I, had to, it I had some butter, some maple syrup, a little gritty, but extra minerals for nothing. So it's, it's not, no kidding, it's really part of my form of uh, emergency preparedness. Buckminster Full was one of my heroes, and I had the opportunity to even hear him talk. And, and um, one of my favorite sayings is, is that you never change things by 
fighting the existing reality. You can't fight the existing reality. To change something, you have to build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So here's my proposal for the new model, is that we get our living soil food webs back we get, we stop using the, I mean, literally, you, you, can, you can build topsoil incredibly fast within one season. I'm a, a student of Dr. Elaine Ingham's, too. Uh, we get our, our, our soils fixed and to the, where they're healthy and have the living soil food web. Use heirloom plants, heirloom seeds, for the same reasons we talked about why you want to use heritage breeds, because they have a different human nutritional value for you, in my opinion. Okay. So here's kind of what we talked about really quickly. We talked about uh, nutritional po poverty and hidden hunger, why you want to use heritage stocks and heirloom seeds. Uh, didn't go into visions, but I think you've got a new one anyway, Re creating living topsoils and uh, strengthening local foods. So if I'm going to give you a blessing, I already did, but I'm going to give it to you again. From you, what I wish for all of us, myself included, is may all your soils have a strong, healthy, living food web the soil have be alive. May all your seeds be heirloom seeds, and may all your breeds be from heritage livestock. But most of all, may the flock be with you. Thank you all so very, very much. I really appreciate your attention on this. Thank you. Okay.